Well, I said we'd be right back again, and here's my friend Lloyd, um, brand new. We've just gotten to know each other. You have all just gotten to know him also with the previous episode. But now we're going to get into what he was talking about there uh, in his introductory ta- uh, talk. We're going to actually zero right into Sharia law. Now, for some of you, this is new. You may not understand what he's referring to. You may not even know the importance or the significance of why uh, we're spending so much time at what's uh, what's this all about. I'm going to let Lloyd do that because Sharia law is foundational for every Muslim. Not every Muslim may know that. Not every Muslim may tell you that. In fact, many Muslims here in the West, they would kind of shrug their shoulder and say, well, that's not for us. We now live in the West. Sharia does not impact upon this. Lloyd is going to help you with that. And he's going to show you that from the very beginning, it has been enormously important. It is absolutely significant. And because it is so significant and because of its foundational impact on Islam, uh, we've asked Lloyd, the expert in this area, to do just that and show us the impact of it. So for this first episode, we're going to define terms. I'm going to let her give it over to Lloyd now. Lloyd, over to you. Help us. Bring us into this. Give us some idea of where you're going to go with it. I'm going to do a simple introduction to everyone about Islamic law. So generally, we can use the term Islamic law, and I might use the term Sharia. I might say Sharia law. I might even use the term fiqh. Technically, they are two different things, but generally speaking, the common term is just Sharia. People will simply say that. Even Islamic scholars will just say Sharia when they mean. And we'll define the differences between those two words as we go. And I will show you how they were derived, how they are applied. I will start early on with showing you specific laws so you can see exactly what these laws are. And you can actually trace them back to the behavior within Muslims. You'll be able to show how they explain <coughs> So it's going to be a very easy introduction, and then we will start to get very technical. I will introduce terms. I will start explaining these technical terms. It can be a little daunting at first, but once you get it, it's actually really quite straightforward. So we'll have the rules, the doctrines. Also, I will not be using the Quran very much. The Quran is not very necessary here. Uh, We will occasionally refer to it, especially when when the Sharia law explicitly refers to it. Otherwise, we were looking at the doctrine derived from the verses. This is not about verses. This is not about hadith. This is about doctrine and laws derived from these so that these can be applied in the life of Muslim and within the Islamic community as a political and legal system. My presentation is called the Muslim Talmud Sharia Fiqh, Islam's Sacred Law. There's a specific reason why I've called it the Muslim Talmud. It is essentially the equivalent of the Talmud. There are some differences. We will discuss those. One difference is the Talmud has been collected essentially into a single volume. So it's very easy to go to the Talmud and read through it. However, the Sharia is distributed. It's distributed across multiple schools. And of course, no one scholar has everything. No one school covers everything. So you are required to move across different schools, different books. So in other words, You need to know where something is in multiple books and they constantly cross-reference. It's like hyperlinking from web pages, right? You're constantly jumping from book to book. And also there are certain scholars who are the specialists in a given field. So all the scholars, all of the books will then reference another scholar whose work, maybe a chapter in a book is critical in that area or is the fundamental, is is the prime source of information. So then from one place, you have to jump to another place. So this is what makes Sharia very difficult to comprehend. Any questions before I continue, Jay? No, this is good. Just feel go. I have no questions so far. Yeah, you're just introducing it. So it'll be when you start making uh, claims that I'll probably jump in. Yeah, certainly. Right. Sharia. Sharia. Sacred or secret? Is Sharia sacred? Yes, it is. Is it secret? Well, yes, it is. However, notice what we've learned about Sharia would be things like this. This is a series of pamphlets that were put up and stickers that were placed all over London, I believe it was, Sharia control zone. This is where Sharia law was enforced. You can see it. These are Sharia police, Sharia for Britain, Sharia, the only solution. Sharia will dominate the world. Sharia, the only option for the UK. Now, Muslims want Sharia. They want us to live under the Sharia. However, what is the Sharia? Why don't they simply openly talk about the Sharia. We know it's a legal system. We know it's a political system. Why don't they simply clarify for us what it is? I'm going to be clarifying for you what it is, and I'm going to be explaining why they simply will not tell us what Sharia is. Now, before we continue, 
I want to bring up this slide. It's called an Arabic Quran, right? And this is a book by Arthur Jeffrey called Foreign Words in the Quran. And you'll notice there are a number of words here that are part and parcel of the Quran. You've got here Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, Ethiopic. And down here, you've got Amharic, so you can add those few words together. This is not a complete list. Newer research has shown us there's additional words that Arthur Jeffrey missed. I think this is a 1936 book. I made this slide myself. I will provide the link in the description for you to have a look at this spreadsheet yourself. But notice also there's a lot of Greek. There's a lot of Syriac. So we will start to look at some of the sources of this. And obviously, they've taken sources from outside of Islam and incorporated them into the Quran and into their other texts. So we'll make sense, especially of why so much Greek? Why is there so much Greek within Islam? Right, moving on. Now, secrets and weaknesses. This is a ruling directly out of the most popular, the most common Sharia law manual in the world. It's called the Reliance of the Traveler. Again, links will be made available in the description. If a Quran is being purchased for someone, it is obligatory that the person be Muslim. The same is true of books of Hadith and books containing the words and deeds of the early Muslims. Quran in this context means any work that contains some of the Quran, even a slight amount. This ruling holds for any religious books, even the tabakat of Sharani. Sharani is a name that we will cover later, very, very important scholar, especially with relation to Islamic law, to the Sharia. Now, do you have any questions before I continue, Jay? No, I'm just going back to go back to the previous slide there. That's just I'd like Certainly. to for people just to remind people uh, the one before this. There, take a look at that, folks. Uh, <laughs> some of you will probably be shocked. You can go to this one as well. Those banners there are from London. I know those people in the, those pictures. Uh, the guy that's speaking, I know. Uh, he is the lieutenant for Anjam Chowdhury. This is the Mahajuru party. The, these are my friends. These are the guys and gals I got to know. These are, I went to their meetings. I actually taught at Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, the man that introduced, that actually created the Mahajuru party. He would invite me up to uh, there in Tottenham to teach at his school. And the first time I went to teach at his school, Lloyd, he introduced me this way. He said, Sheikh Omar Bakri is, uh, Muhammad is from Syria, uh, but he was by far the, the most radical and certainly the most charismatic of all the teachers there in Britain when I was there in the 19, this is back in the 1990s. Uh, this is before 9-11. I'm sorry, no, this was after 9-11. Sorry, this is be just post 9-11. So we're talking about two, 2002, 2003, 2004. And uh, he introduced me into his class saying, this is my favorite Christian, but this will be the first man I kill when Islam comes to Britain, when they introduce Sharia law. My first debate with him was in 1999 uh, and in front of about 3000 radical Muslims. We did a basically what we did is, is Islam relevant for the 21st or the 20th century? This is the end of the 20th century. And he went right down through showing what Islam would look like in the 20th century. And everything he did, he pulled out of Sharia law. He took it, but he always sourced it in scripture. He took every category that he was talking about. So when he said, we're going to make sure all the women are covered up. And then he went right to chapter 33, 59 of the Quran to prove, to support that. And anybody who is uh, a thief, we're going to cut off their hands. And they went right to chapter 5, verse 38. So he supported everything he said in scripture. And this gave him a huge amount of authority, enormous amount of authority. And that's why he was so popular. Uh, these study control zones that you see in that picture there with the, those were mainly on the east side of London. That was in Tower Hamlets, uh, Tower Hamlets, which is mainly a Bangladeshi community. And they, these look at uh, uh, these little placards that they said, if you look at it carefully, you can see no more drinking, no more uh, uh, any type of gambling, no more dancing, no more music, no more everything that people in London love to do. They were going to shut it down and they were going to dictate for everybody. It wasn't just for the Muslims. This means everybody living in the Tower Hamlets area would have to follow by those dictates, which goes against British law. Interestingly, they even claimed that part of the city as an Islamic state. And they didn't say state, but they would claim that these laws are instituted because the majority of people, it didn't have to be unanimous, just even the majority of people, they were Muslim. Therefore, they could dictate it using the, uh, as they said, they, uh, using the, the, uh, the structure of British law in order to do that. Now, go to the next slide that you just showed looking at the Quran. Yeah, folks, take a look at what he has at the top. And thanks for doing this, Lloyd. This is brilliant because I've not seen anybody who actually took Arthur Jeffrey's material and put it into a 
visual slide that visually you can see the importance of Syriac and Aramaic. Are you all following that? The importance of Hebrew, Greek, and Ethiopic. These are all Jewish and Christian languages. That's why this is so important. Look at the numer the how much how many words that have been borrowed. 382, 300, 257, 205, 196. Are you now understanding why we're finding so much of the Quran has been borrowed from those sources? And you look at just the number of words, and yet all the way through the Quran, Lloyd, it does say, doesn't it, that this is an Arabic Quran and the Arabic logic for the Arabic yes. people. Over and over, it keeps on reminding the reader. Why would it remind the reader that if there was something in contradistinction that it's that it is confronting? Well, it's confronting all these other languages. It turns out it is not just an Arabic Quran. In fact, many of the major words in the Quran are borrowed from those very languages because they need those words to underline and give foundation to the ideas that they that they, of course, foment. Fascinating. Thanks so much for that. But I just wanted to bring people back no. to show the importance of why you're going to Sharia law and the importance of why much of this is borrowed from other sources. Right. Okay, I'm going to bring up, you mentioned that the Sheikh discussed amputation. You said that this Sheikh discussed amputation, right? And he went to a single verse of the Quran, I believe. Now, let's have a look. This, since you brought this up, this is the Hedaya. This is the jewel in the crown of the Hanafi school of fiqh. This is four volumes. It is roughly 2,652 pages for many, many imams when they go to seminary and they qualify as a judge or as someone who is trained in Islamic law in the Sharia, this will be the final manual that they will study because it is so detailed, it is so dense. Now let's have a look here. This one is called Book 7 of Saraka or Larceny. Chapter 1, Introductory, page 82, but have a look here, Chapter 2. So Jay, if you can just read this title, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, if you can just read this here. Yeah, of thefts which... Occasion, uh, occasion, occasion. Of occasion. So that would be occasion of, because S, that's an old S. That's yeah. the, 100 years old. This was translated in 1751. Understand okay. Sharia is the word of Allah. It is the law of Allah. It is eternal. It can never be abrogated. It can never be annulled. It can never be replaced. Yeah. So we have to realize that the F was the S uh, letter back then. Now we've changed it to the S letter. So of thefts, so, which occasion amputation. And of the manner of cutting off the limb of a thief <laughs> and the execution. Now, notice this starts in page 87 and goes down to roughly a page 126. You're looking at 44 pages of information which explains how to cut off the limb of a thief, when, under what conditions, how. Now, you, have, you mentioned a single Quran verse, and here there are 44 pages he could have shown live on the screen. The problem is Sharia is a secret. He cannot explain this. He's not allowed to reveal this. Look so at the importance. If that, the laws exist, yeah. why didn't he go to the law? Sorry, Jay. I mean, you're just you're making a huge point here, and this is. I hope that people are 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 understanding it. And and what 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 Lloyd, I thank you for doing this. It's not just the Quran, which gives us just one verse. People say, okay, that's just one verse. What what Lloyd, you're making a huge point, and that is, if you want to see the application of. What the Quran is, if you want to see the, uh, the where they exegete it, you need to go to the law itself and 44 pages just on why and how, even the method that they're going to cut off the hands, all of it is unpacked there. That is shows that this is enormously important. Yes. So one verse, you see, now an issue is that you go to one hadith, which has 20 words, and you go, well, there you go, that's it. I guess we're going to have to do our own exegesis. Well, please understand the exegesis was done a thousand years ago. They've written literally hundreds of pages. Now, this is simply, this is the law derived from a single Quran verse in one school. There are four major schools that are recognized. Each school will have its own laws. So they will total hundreds of pages. So why did he not simply open up the Sharia manual and say, okay, here are the laws. Here's all 40 pages. Let's look at the relevant laws. And there's a very good reason why they do not do that. And at some point, we can actually go through this, read through this, and you can see how all of that is applied from the minds of the finest scholars of Islam. Who 
Lloyd, this is exactly what you're all about. And this is why you wanted to come on board. This is why everybody says, bring Lloyd on board. Because what he's going to show you is not just the fact that there may be one verse in the Quran that refers to, in this case, cutting off of hands. There is an enormous amount of background material that is just as foundational and just as important as to how you're to cut off the hand, where you're to cut off the hand. What is the purpose? What is the jurisdiction? What's the And this background material Muslims don't want to talk about because they would rather they just say, oh, just one verse in the Quran, therefore it's not significant. Hugely significant if you're going to spend 44 pages in just one manual that represents just one school of four, and you can understand then why this is enormously important for, if, for those Muslims around the world who are watching and seeing people's hands cut off. I here's a Let me just show you this picture right here of the stadium where they are actually amputating hands. They amputate hands. They're still doing this today. It is quite normal in m- many Muslim countries to amputate hands. Muslims here in the West don't want you to know this. Muslims here in the West don't want us to talk about it. Muslims here in the West don't want you to see. They, in fact, they would say this is something for 1400 years ago. It's nothing to do with today. It has nothing to do with us as a Muslim. But yet what you're saying, Lloyd, is every Muslim, if they want to know what the Quran is saying, this one verse in chapter five, verse 38 is saying, you better go back and see what the Hidayah actually amplifies it and and understands it. Listen, we do that in Christian, as I'm a Christian, and we do that in Christianity. If you want to see what Jesus said, you go to Paul's, you go to Paul's commentaries and you see how took the gospel and unpacked it for Ephesus or unpacked it for Philippi or unpacked it for Colossus or did the same thing for Corinth. That's how we live by following Paul's letters. In the same way, Muslims, in order for them to understand one verse, cutting off our hands, how that's to be impacted in real day life and how they're to apply, you need to go to the Hidayah or uh, 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 these other manuals that are for each one of the fic- four schools of fiqh. Great that you're doing this. This is so important. Um, as before, as we bring this to a conclusion, what are you going to do next? Where are you going to go next with your next episode? The next episode, I introduce the sources. I will briefly discuss why Sharia is secret, that Muslims are not allowed to share this information with you. And then we're going to talk about Islam as not as a religion, but as a deen we begin to learn that Islam is a deen. A deen is a political system. And a deen is a political system that has much in common with political systems like Nazism, communism, and fascism. Okay. Most people, most Muslims listening, deen would be the practices. You're going to unpack that and show that this is foundational to everything that they must do, the practices that they must participate in. Correct. Islam does not call itself a religion. It calls itself a deen. And a deen is a political and legal system. Okay, that's still next time, folks. Come on back. We're going to have an awful lot to do with Sharia law. This is Jay and Lloyd from the United States and Poland. Over and out.